Revelation chapter 11. We're in Revelation chapter 11 this morning. and Let's go to the Lord in prayer before we get started here. Lord, I pray that as we study Your Word, You'll show us things from it. I pray that You'll take in a blessed studying of Your Word. Uh, not only uh, strengthen our minds and our faith in You and the things that are in Your Word, but also take in a just help our hearts to be molded and flexible to the things that You will have us learn and do. I pray that You'll have Your way with us and that You'll speak to us this morning. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Revelation chapter 11. Now, a lot has gone by for me in the last two weeks, so I can't really remember exactly where I was. I know we were studying Moses and Elijah, the two witnesses. can't remember exactly how far I got into that study. I think I was going to explain why... Moses was the second witness. Uh, is that not where I was at? Does anybody remember? Anybody take notes? Or Okay. So let's go with a uh, look at some things with Moses. We took and uh, looked at some uh, things dealing with uh, Elijah, where Elijah causes it not to rain. Elijah calls fire down from heaven and consumes his enemies. And I took you to the verses in Malachi where it gives you a direct prophecy that Elijah would come again. And then I showed how John the Baptist comes in the spirit of Elijah, but that Elijah still will come. It's prophesied in Matthew chapter 17 that Elijah is still coming in the future even after John the Baptist is put to death. So we know one of the two witnesses is Elijah. Now, the next one that we look at is Moses. You say, are you 100% sure it's Moses? No, I'm 99.9% sure. All right, which for me is a passing grade, so I teach it as doctrine. (laughs) Okay, Um, the verse, the Bible doesn't directly say one of them is Moses. But the evidence, as far I'm willing to take and uh, give them the sentence due to circumstantial evidence. All right, so we're going to look at that. Uh, take your Bible and turn to Deuteronomy 34. Now, first thing I want to show you is that there's something unique about Moses' death. Moses dies, but he's not like, in his death, he's not like other men. Just like when. Elijah was caught up to heaven. The prophets, the school of the prophets, they say, Sirs, let's go and look for him. And Elisha says, you can look for him, but you're not going to find him. So they go and they look for his body, but they can't find the body of Elijah because it was caught up into heaven in a fiery chariot. Uh, Elijah did not die on earth. Now Moses dies, but they still cannot find his body. And we find later on why that is. His body's taken. Now look at, look at Deuteronomy chapter 34. Deuteronomy chapter 34 and look at, I want verses, um, let's see, 5 and 6. So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab according to the word of the Lord. And he buried him in a valley in the land of Moab over against Beth Pir, but no man knoweth of his sepulcher unto this day. All right, so who buried him? The Lord did. The Lord buries the body of Moses. It's Joshua's given a certain amount of information here that he's pinning in. But what's unique is there's a book in the New Testament written by one of Jesus' disciples, Jude. It's a very short book. And that book has always amazed me because it says things that only the Lord can know. And it talks about things that none of the rest of the Bible talks about. So how so many thousands of years later does Jude know these things? Well, you've got to remember who taught Jude. 
is Jesus Christ. And all the stuff in the past was very fresh to Jesus Christ. I'm sure them disciples, some of the stuff that they wrote, the Lord told them these things in the three and a half years of ministry. Now, go to the book of Jude and let's look what Jude says about the body of Moses. Now take your Bible and turn to Jude. Jude chapter 1, there's only one chapter. And pick up verse 8. Likewise also these uh, filthy dreamers defile the flesh, despise dominion, speak evil of dig dignities. Yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke thee. Now a uh, question, why is Michael the archangel fighting with the devil over the body of Moses? God wanted it for suffering. Why would Jude write that? Now, he's given an illustration of the power that the devil has. Now, even Michael the archangel didn't bring a railing accusation against him, against the devil. But it brings out something that happened in the past, and that's Michael the archangel gets into this controversy over the body of Moses. Why is that? Well, God has a use for that body. He wants to use it again. Yes, sir. Question. Because the body was buried in the devil's kingdom. The devil's property. Now, nah, it's so Moab. Right it. it did not belong there. And so God had to send uh, his servant to get it. No. But does he do that with any other of the bodies? They're waiting for the resurrection. doesn't matter where the body is. So God wants that body for a reason. I mean, you don't take and come across a passage of scriptures like this and say, well, that's insignificant. No, it was put there for a reason. And the Lord wants that body again. He's going to reuse it. And with Elijah, his body's taken up to heaven in a fiery chariot. He doesn't even die. Okay, you have two characters like that. You have Enoch... And you have Elijah. Some people think Enoch will be the next witness that comes, but there's no indications of that in the Scripture. You have way more to indicate Moses than Enoch. Uh, when it comes to typology, Enoch is a type of the church age saint that will be raptured and never die again. Where Moses is not that type. Moses is a different type. Now, uh, take your Bible and let's look at uh, Moses again. And uh, one of the curses you have in the, uh, that's wrong on the world in the tribulation is water being turned into blood. Now, there's only one man in the Old Testament that turns water into blood. You don't have that miracle anywhere else. Take your Bible and turn to uh, Exodus chapter 4. Exodus chapter 4. Look at verse 9. Exodus chapter 4, verse 9. And it shall come to pass, if they will not believe also these two signs, neither hearken unto thy voice, that thou shalt take of the water of the river, and pour it upon dry land, and the water which thou takest out of the river, shall become blood upon the dry land. So uh, that's one of the signs that is given to Moses. And that will show up in the tribulation. You'll have the water being turned into blood. The other thing we see with Moses, like Elijah, he uses fire to consume those that challenge him. Take your Bible and turn to Numbers. Numbers chapter 16. Numbers chapter 16. So uh, Elijah calls fire down from heaven several times. You have it when he burns up the altar with the challenge of the prophets of Baal, but you also have it when the uh, Syrian, I, I believe it was the Assyrians come against him, and he says, if I be the man of God, let fire come down from heaven and consume these 50. And then he does it again. And uh, he, he got pretty handy with that little trick. 
in the tribulation when these two witnesses are challenged, fire will come out of their mouth and consume their enemies. So uh, they have this ability. Now look at how Moses uses this in Numbers chapter 16 and look at verse 31. Numbers 16 verse 31. It says, And it came to pass as, as, as he made an end of speaking all these words that the ground clave asunder that was under them and the oaf opened her mouth and swallowed them up in their houses on all the men that uh, appertained to Korah and all their goods. They and all that appertained to them went down alive into the pit and the earth closed upon them and they perished from among the congregation. And all Israel that were round about them fled at the cry of them and they said lest the earth swallow us up also, and there, now look at it in verse 35, and there came out a fire from the Lord and consumed the 250 men that offered incense. And the Lord spake unto Moses. Now that was the challenge. They challenged Moses as a prophet of the Lord, and the Lord set him aside and showed that he was with Moses. But part of that challenge is there's fire that comes up out of the earth and consumes them. So you have that, um, that particular thing working for both Elijah and Moses where fire consumes their enemies. And uh, I'm not sure if there's anybody else in the scriptures where that happens. Where the Lord uses fire to consume their enemies in that form. All right. Now, Bo, Moses is an example of challenging false prophets in the last days, which is what these two witnesses will do during the tribulation. Take your Bible and turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and look at verse 1. 2 Timothy 3, 1 says, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own self, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women, laden with sins, led away with diverse lusts, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now as Janus and Jambres withstood who? Moses. So those are the two magicians that was working with Pharaoh. It actually names them. Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. So uh, Moses is used as an illustration as in the last days of somebody with a false prophet withstanding them. So what you have with both these witnesses, uh, both Moses and Elijah were anointed by God as being the one that God was using at that time. Both appear later with the Lord on Mount Transfiguration. Both destroy their enemies with fire. Both smite the earth with plagues. Both bring in, um, bring in a challenge with um, drought and uh, attacking the land with plagues. Um, both have a challenge with Antichrist types or false prophets. With Moses, it was Pharaoh and the two false prophets, Moses and Elijah. With uh, Elijah, I mean, Mo, uh, the Pharaoh and his two magicians. And with uh, Elijah, it's Ahab and the false prophets of Baal. Both are on Mount Sinai 40 days and 40 nights. They both are there, and they have neither eat or drink, which is a miraculous thing. That's not something you can do. You can't go without water for more than three days. But uh, both 
Moses and Elijah does that. Both are mentioned in Malachi chapter 4. So uh, the similarities, there's just too much. There's too much there to ignore Moses as the second witness. Uh, I believe in the two witnesses and that it's Moses and Elijah. Elijah's for sure. Moses is, uh, the evidence is just too much. All right, back to uh, Revelation chapter 11. Revelation chapter 11. Let's pick up verse, see, I think we were on uh, verse 4. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the Lord God of the earth. And if any man will hurt them with fire, proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. These have power to shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy. Now, uh, Elijah actually shuts the heavens for three and a half years, just like it will be done in the tribulation. And have power over waters to turn them into blood. So the first one's Elijah, the second one's Moses. Uh, that's the power that Moses had. And to smite the earth with all plagues as oft as they will. Well, that's what Moses did. Uh, he took and uh, smote the earth with plagues as he chose, or as the Lord led him to. Verse 7, And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit. Now that's a key verse because you want to connect that with uh, Revelation chapter 9 with Apollyon. Apollyon does what? He comes out of the bottomless pit. And it tells you the beast comes out of the bottomless pit. So you know the two are connected there. Uh, the beast, the anti, which we know to be the Antichrist in the tribulation, is the devil incarnated into a man, but he comes out of the bottomless pit. And that just shows you what I was trying to show you, that the Antichrist goes from the man of sin and he becomes the devil incarnate there when Apollyon comes out of that pit and enters into that body. All right. So uh, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. You say, but I thought these were the two witnesses. You know, death means nothing with God as far as victory goes. The Bible says, O death, where is thy victory? Or, or, O grave, where is thy victory? O death, where is thy steam? 1 Corinthians chapter 15, when it's talking about the resurrection. He's not worried if you die. If you die, that doesn't bother God at all. Why? Well, because he can make you again out of the dirt of the ground and breathe right back into you the breath of life. Death means nothing to God. And the devil beheads these two witnesses, but that doesn't mean anything to the Lord. That doesn't mean that uh, he gets the final victory. He gets a temporary victory. But he doesn't get the final victory. Yes. Yes. It doesn't, well, in the context of the way I'm saying it. All right. The death does not bother the Lord in that he feels the devil had the victory. But the Bible says, as far as him feeling our infirmities, it's a precious thing. So in other words like this, when it comes to, I'll use myself as an example here, when it comes to my wife, well that meant the world to me. Okay? Now, do I look at that and say, well God, that doesn't bother God at all. No, that's where precious in the eyes of the Lord are the death of His saints. Because the Lord's allowing that, but as far as 
he's concerned, it's not going to bother him as far as knowing what the end result is. She's up in the Lord, up in heaven with the Lord right now. But when it comes to the devil having victory, it doesn't bother. Him. Now that's the context I'm using it in. It doesn't bother God at all that Satan kills his saints. They're slaughtered all day long. Why does God allow that if it bothers them? Why would God allow the devil to have victory over the saints? Why does he allow? Because he's, he already sees the end. He's just going to resurrect them. He already sees the end result. He's not worried if the devil kills his saints. That's not going to mess God's plans up. Just because the devil has victory over these two witnesses, that does not mess God's plans up. He's fixing a resurrect. Uh, Lazarus, uh, and you'll see this with Lazarus. When Jesus weeps, uh, where's the passage with Lazarus? Is that, isn't that in Luke? Luke, huh? John 11, 35. Is it John 11? Take your Bible, look at John 11. John chapter 11. All right, you got two contexts here. John chapter 11. Let's pick up verse 13. Or let's, let's go back, let's get uh, verse 11. These things said he after that, he saith unto him, O friend, Lazarus sleepeth, but I go that I may awake him out of his sleep. Then said his disciples, Lord, if he sleep, he shall do well. Howbeit Jesus spake of his death, but they thought they had spoken of taking of rest and sleep. Then said Jesus unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead, and I am glad for your sakes that I was not there to the intent ye may believe, nevertheless, let's go on to him. Now, uh, later here it says Jesus wept in verse 35. Yet there in the verse it says, I am glad. Well, those contradict each other. They contradict each other. Here he's weeping. Why? Because he's weeping with those that weep in the moment of sadness. It was the appropriate thing for him to do. To comfort somebody, you have to weep with them. There it's precious. But why would he be glad? Well, because he knows that through it, Lazarus' death is going to show his glory. So that's where I'm saying that with Moses and Elijah, the devil never has victory when it comes to the saints with his death, that doesn't bother God at all. That's not going to bother God. He's actually glad because he gets to show his glory. He's just going to resurrect him right back up. And when he does it here with the two prophets, I mean, they behead him. And life comes back into the body three days later and they stand up and the heads, I imagine the heads go right back on them. Otherwise, they go up to heaven as the headless horsemen. <laughs> Man, <laughs> jump up on that white horse and take off, you know. And it says, great fear fell upon them and did what? Now turn to Revelation chapter 11. Look what happens when God resurrects these two bodies. They don't repent, but God gets something. What does God get out of it? He gets glory. And they did what? They glorified God. Right? Isn't that what it says? Look at verse, uh, verse 13. In the same hour was there a great earthquake, and the tenth part of the city fell, and in the earthquake were uh, slain men seven thousand, and the remnant were affrighted, and what? Gave glory to the God of heaven. So God gets glory out of Lazarus. God gets glory out of these two prophets dying. And you know what God also gets glory out of? He gets glory out of every martyr that dies for His name. Say. So He gets glory. So there's two aspects of it. You have one, precious are the death of His saints. Why? Because He's touched with your infirmities. God's not one that isn't compassionate with your sorrow. He is. So, so you can't sit there and look at the death and say, well, God doesn't care at all. But let me tell you, death doesn't bother Him like it bothers us. 
I preached a message on Easter where the angel looks at Mary and says, Why weepest thou? How many of you remember that message? Well, that's the view of the angels. Why are you weeping? Well, of course she's weeping. The Lord died. All we see is death. The angel sees the resurrected body and says, Well, why weepest thou? Death has no power over them. Why are you weeping? Because all they're seeing, what they're seeing is the glory side of it. Okay? So there's two sides of death with the Lord. He's understanding toward us and the pain that we go through. Death for us isn't a glorious day. It's a sorrowful thing. It's a painful thing. And it's hard to see the glory through death. It's hard for us to see that. But with the Lord, it's a different direction. I mean, He sees both sides of it. Alright, back to uh, Revelation chapter 11. Revelation chapter... I mean, does that answer your question, brother? Yes, thank you. Yes. Revelation chapter 11. And look at verse 8. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of that great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. So it identifies where this takes place. That's Jerusalem. The great city which is called Sodom and Egypt. Now look back to uh, verse um, 11. I mean verse 2. Verse 2. But the court which is without the temple, leave out and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles. And the what? Holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. So there it's a holy city. And the next place, it's Sodom and Egypt. Spiritually called Sodom and Egypt. Well, what's the difference? Well, one is the reputation of the city through the ages. The next is the condition of the city while the Antichrist is ruling it. Spiritually in its condition, while the devil is in rule over it, is Sodom and Egypt. Now that's a great truth, and that's a truth you can actually apply to your life too. When you're living in the flesh, you're Sodom and Egypt. But when you're living by the Spirit, you're holy. Now do you get it? Do you get it? So how does God look at your life? Well, if it's controlled by the flesh, He looks at just rotten. It's rotten. It's a rotten life. But if you're being led by the Spirit and the Spirit's controlling your life, well then, your life is holy. The Bible tells you, be ye holy even as I am holy. You know what that takes? That takes some work on your part. Now there, I mean, you want to get the standing in the state, we're talking about the state of a man. Um, this is a great truth you want to get. I probably ought to do a message on this again. I'll do one about every year. You have your standing in Christ, and then you have your state in Christ. Alright, your standing in Christ is what Christ does in you that's absolute and eternal. You're sealed by the Holy Spirit of God, that soul is clean forever, separated from the flesh, and it uh, will never be touched by the devil. That is your standing in Christ. The whole, I'm one with Christ. That's my standing in Christ. I have eternal life. That's my standing in Christ. I have His righteousness. That is my standing in Christ. As far as my soul is concerned, it stands in Christ. But as far as my body is concerned, that is my state in Christ. Your state changes according to the leading of the Holy Spirit. Uh, as Paul said, Oh, who shall deliver me from this body of death? He says that after he's saved. In other words, as you allow sin to control your mortal body, your state changes. You lose fellowship with the Lord and your body becomes unprofit less profitable for the Lord. 
But as you yield to the Holy Spirit of God, and He brings the fruits of the Spirit into your body, you become more useful for, to God. And you become more holy. Your state will go up and down through your life. It changes according to how you're letting sin reign in your body or the Holy Spirit. Where you're standing in Christ never changes. Because that's in Jesus Christ's control. That's not in your control. So you want to get, as you come through a verse, is it talking about your standing in Christ? Or is it talking about your state? So when you see that your mortal body and sins of the flesh, that's your state. But when you see that you're holy without sin, that's your standing. Because that's what Christ is. That's Christ in you. And Lopit, when you take these two things and try to make them the same, that's where a guy starts believing he can lose his salvation. Because he sees his state and he thinks it's his standing. Well, your state is not your standing. Those two changes. That's a whole lesson and a whole sermon. Now, how did I get off on that? <laughs> oh, the difference between the holy city and it being Sodom and Egypt because of the condition it's in at the time. All right, that's how I got it, just shown that that's a picture of this. Okay? So when you let, basically, when you let sin reign in your body, you're like Sodom and Egypt. You're full of the world and you're full of the devil. You say, a de can devil possess a Christian? Well, I don't know about possession, but he sure can gain ground on the Christian's life and hold that ground and influence the Christian in a large way. You know, when, uh, when I'm at work, the ones that I get persecuted the most by are not those that claim to be atheists, but backslidden Christians. You say, you think the Holy Spirit's doing that? No, I think the devil's doing that. Why? Because he's using a Christian. You can be used by the devil if you do not keep your flesh in control. You say, I'm a Christian. I'm a son of God. I can be used by the devil. You can be used largely by the devil. Don't ever think that a Christian cannot be influenced by the devil. That's, uh, the Bible tells you neither give what? Place to the devil. Well, if the devil can't gain ground in your life, how can you give place? If it's warning you not to give place, that means the devil can gain ground in your life. He can influence you. Uh, the biggest problems that Christians have after they get saved is they underestimate the power of the devil. They don't realize the spiritual battle that they're in. So every time you sin or you let yourself get farther into a sin, you're given place to the devil. When you flip on that TV and you watch something you know you shouldn't watch and continue to let yourself be desensitized towards something, you're given place to the devil. When you go and you listen to that music that you shouldn't be listened to, you're given place to the devil. When you do not take the stands on the doctrine that you should, you're given place to the devil. Now, you give place to the devil in many different ways. And, it, and once you lose that ground, it's difficult to regain it. My purity as a child... I would love to get back to. But you know what? It's very difficult to regain, regain that sense of innocence that I had. Now, now you know that. You're older in age. You'll never be able to get back to where you were at one time. And it is a struggle to get... Once you get farther away from the Lord and the devil gains ground, it's always a struggle to get back there. Uh, whether it's addictions, any kind of addiction, it's hard to break that addiction. How did that addiction happen? You gave place to the devil. 
So uh, that's gaining ground. That's the devil gaining ground. That was a rabbit trail. Let's get back to Revelation chapter 11. Revelation chapter 11, verse 9. And they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall shall see their dead bodies three days and a half and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. That's not something we really understand today, but it's something that in the medieval times was a common thing. They would hang a man and they would leave him as an example to be seen. Uh, That was normal back in the day which is kind of a morbid thing, but that was when they had public executions and all that stuff. Uh, There's a certain amount of spirit of the devil that's behind that, whereas glorifying the death, which is not something that I I think death should be hidden. It shouldn't be open like that. Verse uh, 10, And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry. Now that's how morbid people can be when they hate God. I mean, they're making merry over these, the death of these true prophets and shall send gifts one to another. Now that doesn't mean that the giving of gifts is a bad thing. I had a guy try to take and use this verse one time to illustrate that giving gifts at Christmas and at birthdays was a pagan thing and you shouldn't do that. A giving of gifts is a show of rejoicing. Now, they're just rejoicing over the wrong thing here. (laughs) I mean, it doesn't mean that the giving of gifts is wrong. Thanks be to God for His unspeakable, what? Gift. So, giving of gifts is not a bad thing. The reason you give gifts can be. Okay? So they're giving a gift because they're rejoicing. Shall rejoice over them, make merry, and shall send gifts one to another, because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt on the earth. Uh, God's men are not always popular with the world. Sometimes they're looked as being tormenting. Verse 11. uh, Now with Moses and Elijah, they actually did torment them. (laughs) But uh, they torment them to take and bring bring them to repentance. But because of the hardness of their heart, they did not repent. Okay, verse 11. After three days and a half, the Spirit of life from God entered into them, and they stood upon their feet, and great fear fell upon them which saw them. Now life has always comes from the Spirit of God. When God creates Adam, it says He breathes into him the the breath of life, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and he became a living soul. Okay? Now, uh, in Ecclesiastes, you have two spirits. You have the spirit of man and the spirit of the beast. And it says, when man dies, the spirit of man returneth unto the Lord. So all spirits in man, that shows you that, but the spirit of the beast goes to the ground. And it shows you there's a difference between a man and a beast. Even in a lost man, his spirit returns to the Lord. Because that is the breath of life. And God gives the breath of life to every man. And when man stops breathing, that's when the Lord takes his spirit away. Takes that spirit away. Spirit of life goes away. So the Lord gives and takes that spirit as he chooses. You can quit breathing just like that if the Lord decides to take your spirit from you. That spirit is the life force of the flesh, and that is only given by God. Verse, uh, Spirit of life from God entered into them, and they stood upon their feet, and great fear fell upon them which saw them. I imagine so. <laughs> I imagine so. That, that would be quite the thing to see. We'll stop there with verse... Uh, 11 and take a break and we'll pick up verse 12 next week. Any questions?